You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood. Before I get started on anything else, I want to say a big thank you to everyone who's been listening and supporting the show. It has been incredible to see how much the show has grown over the last year or so in particular. I think I have about five times as many people listening now as I did a year ago. Yesterday, I saw Unchartable, Who Arted has reached number 15 on Apple Podcast Visual Arts Chart, which is obviously tremendously cool for me. Whether you've been putting up with me for years or just stumbled onto the show, I sincerely appreciate everyone who has helped this to grow. Uh, knowing that some people like what I do, it really means a lot to me. It keeps me motivated to keep doing the research, lining up guests, recording, editing, all of the work that goes into putting out two or three episodes every single week. So thank you. Thank you for all your support. Like I said, it really means a lot. Now, today I want to do something a little bit different. I'm going to introduce you to another show. It seems kind of strange, but there are some people who enjoy consuming media that's not completely centered around me. I try to make art accessible for everyone, but in doing so, I tend to simplify some of the stories. I know there are some of you who like to do a little bit deeper dive into the artists and artworks that you love. So today, I'm giving you an episode of another art history podcast. The show is called Art of History. It's hosted by Amanda Mata, who is everyone's favorite TikTok royal commentator and just generally smarter than me. Art of History is another airwave media podcast, and she is absolutely killing it. If you listened to my episode on Fragonard's The Swing, you may recall I did like five or ten minutes on it, but Amanda goes way deeper. So give Art of History a listen, and if you like it, please follow her show, leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. That's one of the easiest and completely free ways to support your favorite podcasters. Honestly, those ratings or reviews, they make a big difference. That's why every podcast you listen to starts with people begging, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. But now to something with dignity. Here's Amanda's show, Art of History. Hello, and welcome to the Art of History podcast, where we look at episodes from history through great works of art. Today, we are diving into the Rococo era, stopping off at the court of Louis XV before venturing out to a country garden park to discuss the painting The Swing. This is going to be a highly requested episode because over on Instagram recently, I asked if there were any works or artists that you, the audience, might be interested in, And oh my, did you deliver. I think the only painting that had more requests than this one was Girl with a Pearl Earring, which is, of course, on my list for future episodes. That list is several pages long at this point, and I have every intention of working my way through it. With that said, you may have noticed lately that my uploads have been a bit delayed, so I am working on maybe developing a better timeline for getting episodes out that works a little better with my life. But we are here together now, so let's dive right into the episode. We are talking about one of the most recognizable paintings of our time, that is The Swing by Jean-Honoré Fragonard. I am going to put a bit of a content warning at the top of this episode for generally suggestive themes. I'm going to try not to be too explicit, which is going to be kind of hard in some places. But if, for example, there are some conversations that you haven't yet had with young listeners in your orbit, I do recommend grabbing headphones for this one. I am also going to switch up our format a bit for this episode. Normally, I will introduce an artwork and then walk us through a close look at it before diving into the historical context. Today, I decided it would be more advantageous to get that context out of the way before we start looking at the painting. So as we do that close look at the painting, I am also going to be doing a bit more explaining of symbols and themes than what I normally do. The Swing is an incredibly lush, detailed work of art, 
and teasing out the meaning little by little, I think, will give you a better grasp of what's going on. So, allow me to transport you back to France in the mid-1700s. Let's forget everything we know about a certain revolution that's coming soon for a few moments, and instead place ourselves at the height of France's 18th century magnificence. King Louis XV has taken the throne at the tender age of five years old, succeeding his great-grandfather Louis XIV, the Sun King. Due to his young starting age, Louis XV will eventually become the world's longest ever reigning monarch, a record that actually still stands today. But until he reached maturity in 1723, France was ruled by a regent, Louis's uncle Philippe, Duke of Orléans. Philippe had the young king transported away from the French court in Versailles to Paris, where he had his own residence in the Palais Royal. The aristocracy had previously been all but forced by the Sun King to live at Versailles so that he could keep an eye on them. But now, with Philippe decentralizing the royal court, the nobles seized this opportunity to flock to Paris as well. There, scientific discoveries, commercial ventures, and meetings of intellectuals encouraged them to join literary and artistic circles. In this way, the aristocrats symbolically distanced themselves with the monarchy and pursued new interests for the first time in a generation. Now, the noble class at this time held both enormous political power and enormous wealth. Many aristocrats focused on leisure pursuits and involved themselves in games of romantic intrigues where they created a culture of luxury and excess that, of course, formed a stark contrast to the lives of most working class people in France. The small but growing middle class would not stand for this for long, but for the time being, the aristocrats controlled over 90% of the nation's wealth. Throughout the reign of Louis XV, this shift in values that I hinted at a moment ago continued in the form of the scientific revolution. This moment, as science edged towards the, quote, modern, encouraged conclusions that were based on observation, not just on metaphysics or spirituality. This idea of a world that behaved according to universal and constant laws, think about Newton and his laws, uh, provided a model for looking rationally on human institutions as well. The Age of Enlightenment that followed gave rise to modern thinkers like Rousseau, Diderot, and Voltaire, who believed in questioning traditional ideas and challenging conventional ways of doing things. There was also this idea that one's physical surroundings should encourage a virtuous way of life and reflect your morals. So in the home of Enlightenment-era citizens, the salon or living room was transformed into a central space. Here, both the emerging bourgeois class and the aristocracy were able to impress and entertain their guests and engage in intellectual conversation. The public needed a new art style to complement their desire for stylish, comfortable home quarters. So what was going to fit the bill artistically? Until about 1700, European art had been characterized by what we call the Baroque, a style favored by the highest tiers of society in Italy, France, and Spain. Wealthy patrons would commission large theatrical works of art and buildings that reinforced their messages of absolute power and authority. In what was called the Age of Magnificence, the goal of Baroque art was to get the spectator to be fully absorbed in what they were seeing, whether that was on a spiritual, intellectual, sensual, or humorous level. This was achieved by using heavy contrast between light and dark, acute detail, deep colors, and elements of surprise and movement to impart a sense of awe. Now, clearly, to outfit the stylish and intimate new home quarters of the elite, art on that sort of grand scale wasn't going to cut it. The subsequent departure from this imposing opulence of the Baroque occurred in what we now know as Rococo art. Artists and craftsmen did away with the grandeur of 17th century art, and the first tangible change was furniture becoming physically lighter so that it could be easily moved around for gatherings. But of course, the wealthy elite had to take things a step further. Mirrors were a popular and expensive way to trick the eye into believing a room was more open and spacious than it really was. This style was first employed to decorate salons, but Rococo interiors aimed to be totally visually unified. There was a sort of coming together of a number of the decorative arts as a result. 
Furniture, friezes, sculpture, ceramics, metalwork, ceiling decorations, and wall decorations like paintings and tapestries were all stylistically woven together in the Rococo salon. In all Rococo art forms, the color palette was generally lighter. Think warm pastels accented with gold. The lines were curvy and serpentine, forms were asymmetrical, and all the trimmings were over the top and intricately designed. Themes of playfulness, frivolity, love, youth, and beauty prevailed, and flowers and seashells became popular visual motifs. The word rococo, in fact, was first used as a tongue-in-cheek variation of the French word rocaille. This was a method of decoration for grottos and fountains using pebbles and seashells embedded in cement. By the 1820s, rocaille was horrendously out of fashion, considered out of date and over-trimmed. And so was the Rococo. At that time, one writer used the term to refer back to the visual arts of the 18th century, and the name stuck. But indeed, from the 1720s to the 1760s, the Rococo represented a new type of lightness and playfulness, wit and eroticism in the arts. Part of the appeal came from Rococo's ability to engross a viewer who, remember, would have been trying to come off as intellectual and sophisticated in visual games that commented on the nature of both art and humanity. Rococo painting would often draw you in through a mixture of visual humor, double entendre, and loaded symbols that rewarded close looking. Viewers' attention would be swiftly drawn between many details sprinkled across a canvas. Its link to the upper class would be the Rococo's eventual downfall. Serious Enlightenment thinkers condemned it for being immoral and indecent, critiquing it as a symbol of the moral decay of aristocratic culture. They called for a new kind of art that would be moral instead of immoral, and would teach people right and wrong. And ultimately, the Rococo and the aristocracy itself would both be carried away in the tide of the French Revolution and the neoclassical art style that followed. If you're interested in learning more about that, I do recommend you go back and listen to the episode on the death of Marat. For now, we are going to stay comfortably in the cushiony world of the Rococo, though. Antoine Watteau is considered the first great Rococo painter known for his soft application of paint, his dreamy atmospheres, and his depiction of classical myths that often revolved around youth and love. His work influenced later Rococo masters such as Francois Boucher, and our subject today, Jean-Honoré Fragonard. Born in 1732 in southern France, Fragonard moved to Paris at a young age and worked for a while as a clerk. He was interested in the arts, though, so he switched and worked in the studio of the still-life and genre painter Jean-Simeon Chardin, where he probably learned just the basic principles of the fine arts. From there, though, he entered the studio of Francois Boucher, where he hit his stride and was soon painting decorative pictures and pastoral subjects very close to his master's natural style. Fragonard's early style was actually more in line with the sensibilities of the earlier Baroque era. He painted sweeping scenes from history, and one of these actually earned him the first prize in the esteemed Prix de Rome competition of 1752. This was a competition where the French government would award prizes to artists to enable them to study the arts further. It ran from 1663 to 1968, so obviously it had a high place in society. After collecting his first place prize, Fragonard entered the L'École des Élèves Protégés in Paris, which was a school established to train the most promising protégés of the French uh, Royal Academy. As a student there, Fragonard further studied history and the classics and traveled to Italy. From 1756 to 1761, he was at the Académie de France in Rome, where he worried his teachers with how slow his progress was. This was perhaps just an unwillingness to complete his assigned artistic chores, as they have been described. A teacher, though, steered Fragonard towards sketching in the open air, and he developed a keen interest in depicting landscapes and architectural sites. When he was back in Paris, Fragonard's focus would shift away from the serious monumental history paintings and rather towards small cabinet pictures. These were small paintings meticulously rendered and intended for the appreciation of private collectors. 
This shift was at least in part to a reaction with some problems with payments coming from the Royal Arts Administration, who were up until then commissioning large history scenes from Fragonard. According to the 1767 journals of the French writer Charles Collet, a gentleman of the French court had previously requested for a history painter known as Gabriel Francois Doyen to paint him his own cabinet picture showing his young mistress on a swing, being, quote, pushed by a bishop with himself admiring her legs from below. Doyen, who had just had major public successes as a religious history painter, thought that maybe he wasn't the best man for this job. He refused the commission and instead suggested Fragonard. Whether Fragonard had already begun to paint his cabinet pictures by this time, or whether it was this commission that sent him in that direction, we may never know. The swing would ultimately prove to be the painting that would mark the successful relaunch of his career, with him now producing paintings for a small, well-informed circle. These would take the form of either highly erotic works or works that required advanced knowledge of art history and old master painting. As we will see, the swing combines a bit of both. And whether it was fate or coincidence, Fragonard accepted the unnamed French gentleman's commission and worked on the swing from 1767 to 1768. I'm going to take a short break, and when we come back, we will get into our close look at the painting. You might use this short sponsor break to pull up the swing on your device. I've listed the full title in the description, and you can also find it over on Instagram at Art of History Podcast. Oh, and while you're there, go ahead and hit the follow button because it will only save you time for future episodes. All right, so while you were pulling up your image of the swing, you might have noticed that it actually has a longer title than what we typically use to refer to it. It actually takes its full title, The Happy Hazards of the Swing, from a printed version that was later circulated around France. That name is our first indication that there might be some underlying messaging going on here. So bear in mind as we look at the painting that I am going to try and explain certain symbols as soon as we come across them. Normally, I do encourage looking at a painting first just with your eyes, just at what you physically see in front of you. but there's a lot going on here, so I am going to add that context as we go. So, our setting is a lush garden where a young woman in a voluminous pink gown is gliding through the air on a swing suspended from a tree. Intimate garden parks like the one depicted here were common sites for aristocratic leisure activities. These outdoor spaces were viewed as less formal than salons and other domestic interiors. Here, on the grounds of a private estate, French nobles could fancy themselves as carefree shepherds or milkmaids, a role-playing game that allowed them to frolic with no regard for the strict regulations of elite society. In addition, the hidden alcoves and secret corners within these gardens enabled men and women to mingle more freely and couples to sneak away unchaperoned. Fragonard's painted garden is rendered in deep earthy tones of emerald green and tawny brown, with touches of light sage and smoky black to help create depth. The leaves that abound are rendered so that the forms of the trees and bushes appear to froth up from the surface of the canvas. I always think of sea foam as a reference point when we're talking about Rococo shapes and forms. Fragonard's brushstrokes are sparingly applied, making everything on the canvas seem to swell slightly and creating a sense of gentle, undulating motion. The young woman at the center of the scene is clad in a bright pastel salmon shade that contrasts beautifully with the deep jewel tones of the background. Green and pink are pretty much opposites on the color wheel, so when placed beside one another as they are here, they will each serve to complement and intensify the other. That pink lets us know that we should focus on this woman as the main actor in our scene. She wears a small straw hat embellished with flowers and a pink ribbon around her neck. This is not the only ribbon that adorns this woman, of course. Her satin dress is bedecked with small frills and flounces in varying sheer delicate fabrics. Beneath her ballooning skirt, we can catch a glimpse of her legs clad in white stockings, and there is even a tiny sliver of exposed thigh above the pink ribbon holding one of these in place. 
This young woman is perched high above the ground on a crimson velvet cushioned swing. Swinging was one of several popular leisure activities common among French elites who enjoyed spending time out of doors. Fragonard had previously used this subject matter in two earlier paintings. They were Blind Man's Bluff and The Seesaw. In the latter, a young woman gleefully raises her arms and legs as she is suspended in midair. This was a clear precedent for the pose of the woman on our swing. With her left hand, she grasps one of the ropes of the swing, which are tied around the knobbly branches of an enormous gnarled tree. Her other arm is raised coyly towards her face in what seems to be a playful gesture. She smiles down to the lower left corner of the canvas, inviting us to follow her gaze towards the base of a large pedestal supporting a marble sculpture. Beneath this lies a young man, partially hidden by an overgrown rosebush. He could be returning her gaze, but it is equally likely that his enraptured expression is directed instead up her skirt. She is, after all, leaning back and stretching out her legs, kicking off a tiny pink slipper from her delicate pointed foot as she does so. This act has been interpreted by scholars as flirtatious, signaling her rejection of the traditional constraints on female modesty. 18th century audiences would have considered this uninhibited behavior quite indecent under normal, indoors circumstances, but in the context of leisure and outdoor play, the established rules of social etiquette were often bent. Thus, her slipper flies off through the air towards the marble statue that conceals the man on the ground. This sculpture is our first hint that the garden park here can also be interpreted as a garden of love. It is a depiction of Cupid, the mythological god of erotic love. Fragonard based this object on a well-known real-life sculpture by Étienne-Maurice Falconet. This was created in 1755 for Louis XV's former mistress, Madame de Pompadour. Both the painted and sculpted Cupids bring their index finger to their lips as they reach with their opposite hand to take an arrow from their quiver. By showing the god facing the swinging woman as he makes this international shushing gesture, Fragonard positions the two as confidants sharing a secret. The subject of their deception is, of course, the man hiding in the rose bushes below. He leans against the statue's pedestal, which is carved with images of dancing Mienads. These were the mythical female followers of Dionysus, the god of wine, whose name literally translates as the Raving Ones. The man lying on the ground has seemingly fallen prey to the type of infatuation caused by Cupid's arrow. In addition to his wide-eyed gaze, his extended left arm also directs our attention to the exposed legs, and by extension, the most intimate parts of the woman. Some critics take his extended arm, a rare erect straight line in this scene, one step further, interpreting it as a proxy male member. It's aiming right towards its target. I know, it's surprisingly vulgar, isn't it? The 18th century French, um, yeah, they weren't known for their purity and innocence. We'll just leave it there. But we're not done yet. Equally icky in my mind is the idea that the layers of the woman's skirt are, quote, opening, <laughs> opening like the petals of the blooming pink roses on the bush below, a visual connection suggesting that her fertility rivals that of the garden itself. And then there's the fact that the man in the bushes holds his hat in his hand, which is an insignificant detail to us. But if you know that in the late 18th century erotic art scenes, men's hats and their bare heads were often stand-in for their members, um, yeah, there's another meaning there. For the woman's part in this encounter, her swing is at the peak of its movement. She's gone just about as high as she can go, positioned at the perfect angle over her lover's outstretched arm. Her missing shoe, read in this erotically charged context, freshly cast off by a bare foot, is suggestive that we are dealing with a loss of virginity at the very least, and the throes of a female orgasm at the most. I will pause here to say that it's important to remember that there's a difference between artist intent and then what is interpreted by the viewer. It's very possible that all of these symbols are simply being read into by modern audiences and that this was not ingrained in the original painting. 
but I do think that those symbols have meaning if that's what so many people are seeing. So take this all with a grain of salt and feel free to pick and choose the meaning that resonates with you. All of those erotic symbols are happening on just the left-hand side of the canvas. A look over at the right side offers an additional facet to the events that are unfolding in the garden park. Behind the woman, slightly in the shadows, besides the garden's trellis and fountain, an older man is operating her swing. He is the figure that the original commissioner of the painting, remember, wanted to be a bishop, but Fragonard has instead depicted him as the husband of the young woman. His smiling expression as he gazes up at his wife suggests that he is blissfully unaware of her hidden lover. A series of looks and gestures connects these three figures, creating an inverted V-shape that visually lets us know that this is, in fact, a love triangle. The woman at the peak of the triangle is shown through her visual prominence to be an active participant in the scheme. To her left, as we have already discovered, are multiple references to untamed passion and desire. The cupid, the overgrown rosebush, and of course, the lover. These references to unchecked passion are balanced by symbols of constraint over on the right-hand side. The husband is using a series of ropes to pull the swing back, creating the momentum necessary to push his wife forward. This, in my reading of the composition, is a sly reference to the fact that only married women could afford to have these types of romantic liaisons, since it was through their husbands that they enjoyed a social standing and financial security. The ropes that the elderly husband uses to pull his wife toward him also resemble a set of reins and are evocative of both the bonds of marriage and the restrictions placed on female sexuality. The rope itself, wrapped a few times around the tree limbs above the woman, is visibly fraying in places, most notably right above her head and at its ends. For now, she is safely suspended in midair between her husband and her lover, but we can imagine her just as easily crashing down to earth in an instant were that line to snap. The idea of taming or reigning in desire is further echoed by a sculpture of two puti riding a dolphin. Puti, P-U-T-T-I, were chubby male children, usually naked and sometimes with wings, who were used to personify love and chaos, really, in a similar vein to what we know as cherubs. But they were also used to represent the omnipresence of God. So while the winged puti here echo the figure of Cupid on the far left, the puto, that's a singular puti, who is gazing up at the swinging woman, adopts a concerned rather than a cheeky expression. Likewise, if you look down at the husband's feet, you will notice a yapping white dog seemingly sounding the alarm on the woman's behavior. Dogs are one of the most well-known symbols of fidelity or marital faithfulness in Western art. This is actually where the classic pup name Fido gets its roots. Instead of being a secret keeper like the stone putti and the cupid, the barking dog threatens to expose the infidelity of his mistress, which is so at odds with his intended purpose. I think it's safe to say that Fragonard understood his assignment. He answered the, quote, libertine intentions of his patron by leaning so heavily on the Rococo style, which he didn't have to do. The Rococo had actually peaked about a decade previously to his starting this painting. He was known to often employ different styles or artistic languages at the same time, and he seems to have seen a Rococo framework as particularly apt for such an erotic scene. By juxtaposing natural and man-made elements in this garden setting, Fragonard emphasizes the freedoms and restrictions that aristocratic elites encountered while playing in these spaces. While the fountains and the trellis on the right side suggest efforts to manipulate and control nature, the overgrown plants and the abandoned rake lying in the lover's bushes suggest that the will of nature, like that of love, can never be fully constrained. As our eyes move from one element in the swing to the next, we discover charged symbols like these and start to recognize familiar characters such as the cupid or the dog. These discoveries provide us with the mental exhilaration that, for Enlightenment Age viewers, would have rivaled the physical thrill of watching your lover ride on a swing. Now, sadly, the figures in the swing are not identifiable as portraits of specific people from the French court. 
but their rich attire and leisurely activities do highlight their status as aristocrats. These playful and erotic scenes were popular among the broader elite clientele that Fragonard came to serve. Unlike large-scale history paintings or the wider genre of portraiture and landscapes, these cabinet paintings were relatively small, 32 inches by 25 inches in the case of the swing, and were again intended for display in intimate rooms. Admiring this painting in the privacy of such a space, the patron and his inner circle would have appreciated its depiction and challenge of societal norms as they were subverted in the pursuit of personal pleasure. And yes, maybe it helped someone in the 1700s get their rocks off. The swing's strong appeal led to the production of a printed version in 1782, which was circulated among a broader, though still elite, audience of collectors. It was later used as a template for countless caricatures of the noble class, hinting at their impending decline in popularity as the 19th century neared. Though the reign of terror during the revolution did cause the art world to forget about Fragonard for a while, interest in his paintings was revived by the end of the 1800s. His handling of light and color seemed to have heavily influenced early Impressionist painters like Claude Monet, for example, who were seeking to capture a moment in time with their brushstrokes. Today, the swing is still popular with contemporary artists and designers. It is reproduced on merch, on posters, on fridge magnets, and obviously you all know and love it, or else it wouldn't have been so heavily requested. Many people also know it from its cameo in the Disney movie Frozen, where Princess Anna playfully adopts the woman's pose in a moment of wistfulness for a life free from restraint. I don't quite know that Disney understood just how freely the central figure in the swing was actually behaving, or they might have gone with another painting. Anna, as we know her, definitely has no business being in that situation. Today, the happy hazards of the swing resides in the Wallace Collection in London. It is widely considered to be one of the masterpieces of the Rococo era and one of the most recognizable paintings in history. And in my mind, that's because whether you do want to enjoy it as a tongue-in-cheek tableau showing a dangerous liaison or as a scathing critique of elite society blithely swinging through the air as their impending doom and ears, there is something for everyone here. That's about all I have for you today. I will be posting a couple of questions so we can have a little bit of a discussion over on the Instagram, so keep an eye out for that. Again, the Instagram for the podcast is at Art of History Podcast. And as always, if you have any questions or comments about this week's episode or what you would like to hear next, I would love to hear from you. You can send me a message over on Instagram or shoot me an email at artofhistorypod at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at arthistoricpod, and I continue to make royal history videos on TikTok at Matta of Fact. That's Matta, M-A-T-T-A, underscore of, underscore fact. Thank you all so much for listening and sticking with me as I try and figure out how to juggle a podcast and my full-time job in education. I am kind of realizing that this is basically two jobs for me at this point, so there are some bumps in the road, but I am eager to get it figured out because I am really, really enjoying putting out this content for you. If you are enjoying the podcast, be sure to rate and review over on Apple Podcasts as it truly does help me out and just the positive feedback, you know, who doesn't want that? So with that, until next time, au revoir.